All right, it is recording. Um, okay. So welcome everybody to the session. I just want to do a quick introduction. My name is Benny. I'm here from the Playground team. Playground is a childcare management software company. Um, we make software to help childcare providers facilitate their whole experience from, you know, enrolling new families, billing, managing their teachers, um, doing everything you do. We're just trying to make it easier for you. Um, and we're happy to be working today with Gary on this awesome webinar, just talking about the post-pandemic government funding opportunities available to childcare providers and small businesses. So without further ado, Gary, take it away. Excellent. And uh, I'll just need screen sharing. Oh, there it goes. Okay, it took a second to kick in. So a pleasure to be with all of you here today and uh, such a great topic to be talking about. Um, as Benny mentioned, I'm Gary Romano, President and CEO of Civitas Strategies. We're a 14-year-old management consultancy, and we're focused particularly on public-serving organizations, so for-profit or nonprofit, as long as they serve the public good. And uh, in particular, over the past few years, we've gotten very deep into working with childcare businesses like yours. Uh, on a variety of topics. And one of those topics that we've been doing um, since the start of the pandemic are the ones we're gonna be talking about today. And in particular, we're gonna be talking about two different programs. One is Families First Leave, affectionately known as FFCRA Leave. Another one is the Employee Retention Tax Credit, which I know many of you have probably heard of. We're gonna talk about what they both are, as well as how you claim it, how they work. So FFCRA leave is of the two, the one that you probably have not heard as much about. This is a program that, now I should say both of these programs are historical programs. These ran, both of them, from March 15th, 2020 through September 30, 2021. So you may be saying, why are you talking to me about something that already happened? Um, it's because both can be retroactively claimed. And we'll talk about how to do that, but I just wanna make sure that you know that because some people will say, well, wait a minute, it's not open anymore. It isn't open anymore, but you can still claim it if you were eligible at the time. So FFCRA leave is essentially a paid leave program. And a lot of small businesses didn't really understand this. And it afforded you time off for COVID, if you had COVID, quarantine. So if you had to quarantine for whatever reason, so it didn't have to be work-related, right? So it might be because, um, you know, like we had one provider where um, the uh, boyfriend who was living uh, in the home um, had been exposed to COVID. So out of an abundance of caution, a family care provider closed down for two weeks because she didn't want the child to be a vector into the home. That would be allowable, right? It could be on the other side of it. Maybe one of your kids came home and was exposed and you said, oh gosh, I'm gonna close for a little bit or I'm not gonna go into work you know, for a couple of weeks, just to make sure that we're okay and we're not gonna make any of the children sick. Either way, as long as you were quarantining and you believe that it was, you know, because of COVID exposure, it would count. Additionally, this also covers family care and home care in school that may have been needed. So the family care part of it is if you are caring for a family member with COVID, um, or in terms of home care and school, if any of you, I know a lot of us were, um, home doing remote school, for example, during part of the pandemic, we'll talk a little bit more about what this means, that's also eligible. So there's a lot of eligibility here, and it's important to know this is, this is a very broad definition of small business that is uh, impacted by this program. So it goes all the way to 500, which is the Small Business Administration definition of small business, but it could all go all the way down to one individual. So if you're, let's say, a solopreneur and you're a family care provider or whatever, maybe somebody you know in your life is, right? Maybe your spouse or significant other is an Uber driver and they're on a Schedule C um, and they're getting a 1099 from Uber, you would still qualify for this. So this is a really broad qualification. And again, it covers time that happened from March 15th, 2020 through September 30, 2021. So let's talk a little bit about like the details of it, right? Because this, as you can imagine, it affects a lot of providers. There's a lot of potential here. 
So really there's two buckets when it comes to families first leave. Bucket number one is COVID illness or quarantine, right? Um, and it should be noted that, you know, you should have some sort of documentation around this. You do not need to send the government a doctor's note. You don't need to have a formal quarantine notice from a physician or anything. It's, it's much more on the honor system. You should have something that's explaining why you're taking the leave off, but it doesn't have to be, you know, an essay or again, something a physician is certifying. So in the case of COVID illness or quarantine, you can get full pay, right? For most of your employees, depending, right? Um, for COVID or quarantine up to $511 per day. And the way that's determined is if you're paying somebody or if you're on a W-2 personally, that's based off of your payroll, right? So you just see, well, how am I paid for eight hours? Does it, is it under 511? Then that's my pay. If it's over, right, then it's capped at 511 per day. If you're a Schedule C, if you're on a Schedule C and you are a sole proprietor, um, you look at line 31 on your Schedule C, which is your net profit, right? That would be the key one that you're determining your, your daily rate off of. This, is, this gets to be a little bit of a pain because if you're, you know, typically folks who are sole proprietors, that number, they try to make it as low as possible because that's where your self-employment tax is. But you're taking that number and you're dividing it by 260. And by the way, we're going to have some online resources that we're going to share that can take you through this. So don't worry if you're not taking notes. It's more about like hearing some of the, the program itself. So again, if you if you were if it was for you, if it was, you know, your employees, they had to take off for COVID because uh, they had COVID or quarantine, it's that full daily rate. If you're caring for a relative with COVID. Like, you know, we had one provider who was caring for her son, her adult son who had COVID. He couldn't take care of himself. You would get two thirds of that daily rate up to $200 a day. Now, I promise you, like of this part of the webinar on Families First, we are going to hit the most complicated part of it right now. It's not going to be too bad. But this is about as complicated as it gets. The way the federal government set it up was they almost gave you, in a way, think of it like two years, right? And, you know, when, if you've worked a W-2 job or for some of you who may have them, you know, like your sick leave will sometimes reset January 1, it's a similar concept. So what happened was the federal government said, you get 80 hours, up to 80 hours of leave for COVID illness or quarantine between March 15th, 2020 and March 31, 2021. April 1, 2021, it resets and you get another 80 hours from then through September 30, 2021. So for example, we had a provider who had to close in January, 2021 for two weeks. And then she had to close again in April, 2021. So in that case, even though it was four weeks in one year, she was able to take two weeks in that first time period and then another two weeks in that second time period. Promise you, this is the most complicated part. But what it means is, you know, as you can see from this, there's a, a fair amount of time that's covered. And these two time periods really enable you to maximize the time you may have had to take off. Because I know many of you had to close more than once during the pandemic because either you had COVID, family member had COVID, or quarantine. Again, that's very broadly defined. If you had to close because of any sort of exposure or suspected exposure, it counts. And again, it could be your, your, your employees as well. It could just be one employee had to go home because she said, oh, my husband got exposed at work. And that really happened, and they would be eligible. The other bucket of eligibility, which is really interesting, is caring for children out of school. And so the definition here is when your school was closed, when it would regularly be open. And this includes remote school, right? So let me explain what we mean by this. So as many of us experienced, um, you know, school would close and you would be, you know, doing Zoom school with your kid. Um, so is school open? 
well, the kid's learning, right? There's the educational system is open, but the school is not. They can't learn on site. The exceptions to this, because it says when it's regularly open, the reason why it says it is, it doesn't include things like we had a snow day, right? And we did have that. Like, you know, for example, we do a lot of work in Texas with some of the storms they experienced in this time period. There was a significant time that their children were out of school. But unfortunately, the federal government says mm -mm, it's got to be when they normally would have been open, not for weather related closure or over the summer, for example. Um, additionally, what you want to think about with this is, uh, was it, you know, again, where the child would normally be in a regular school setting? And what I mean by that is, if you do homeschooling, unfortunately, it doesn't cover it. You know, even if you say, well, it was a different environment, it was a different modality for us at home, still doesn't cover it. But if you were in this situation, if this is separate, by the way, the, the numbers here we're talking are entirely separate from the COVID illness. So you could do that, and then you could do this separately. It covers two thirds of your pay up to $200 a day, up to 10 weeks, so that's 50 days. And what I love about this benefit is that it can be intermittent. And so what do I mean by that? So some of us experienced, and I know many of you did as well, right? The situation where you started to go back to school, then there was exposure, they closed down the school, the kids were back home for a while you are able to charge for when they were home. So even if they went back to school and they came back for another week, that following week, you would be able to include. It can also include intermittent as even one time a week, right? So let me give you a real life example. We had New Jersey, a family care provider, and her son was home through uh, a large amount of time in 2020, right? Like many of us experienced. And um, the family members were able to cover for her every day but Friday. So she had a different family member covering her son every day but Friday. But Friday, there was no family member who could cover. So she had to close her childcare business and help her son, which is wonderful, right? It wasn't like she was mad about it, but that was the way it was. So what we were able to do for her was we were able to take every single Friday and apply it to this credit. So in her case, she accrued a really significant amount of time just by hitting those Fridays. So this is one where there's a great deal of flexibility around it. Um, and I know, again, this is something that could have affected you. If you have employees that you paid for them when they were, when they were doing um, their remote school, you would also be able to get this credit back to you. So you can't do it retroactively and say, gosh, we didn't pay them, but we would now. Doesn't work. But um, if you did pay it and we have some providers who did, um, then this is a way that you could recoup some of those funds. So let's talk about how you how you actually claim it, right? This is not that bad. And if, you know, for some of you who went through the PPP and we did a lot of PPPs with providers. I think that honestly, this and the employee retention tax credit are, are easier than the PPP because you're not going to a bank, you're not doing a whole ton of forms. It's really relatively easy. So what do you do? One, document the rate and time, right? So that could be very, very simple. That could be a very simple log just on a piece of paper that says, our school was closed from this date to this date. And I had to help, I had to close my business and help homeschool my child every Thursday and Friday or homeschool. There I go. Bad one. Remote school. Um, that would be fine. Right. And then my normal rate, if I look at line 31 of my schedule C is this number. I divide it by 260, which is the number of working days in a year. That's my daily rate. That level of documentation, just writing that note and keeping it with your records is good enough. Right. And by the way, if you ever hear me talk about record keeping in businesses, always recommend redundancy, take a photo of it, at least just in case. Um, but that is considered it. If you if let's say you have a larger child care business and you have a whole slew of employees, a payroll report can be fine. We've had uh, providers who have said, 
I ran a payroll report of all the sick leave in these months, and I identified the ones that were COVID related. That's perfectly fine in terms of the record. By the way, you don't have to send this record anywhere. It's just for you if you're ever audited. So as you can see, this is already pretty easy, right? You've, you've essentially self-qualified. Second, you have to alert the IRS. You have to let them know, hey, I deserve this credit. If you have W-2 employees, you're gonna do this through a 941X. And X is the special code that you're gonna to learn today, which means in the, in the IRS world, it means an amendment or a fix to an existing form. So what it tells the, the IRS is that you're trying to fix or change some of the numbers associated with your 941, which is your quarterly tax filing to the IRS for personnel. And by the way, you know those of you who are nonprofits, and you'll often say, but we don't pay taxes with this and with the ERTC, um, you do pay employment taxes. And this is where it's coming from. If you have W-2 employees, you're paying them and paying employment taxes. So you're doing a 941, I assure you. If you're a sole proprietor, or if you have 1099 contractors, this is part of their 1040. So you would do a 1040X, again, to amend it. What happens after this? Each one of these are, and it's gonna be the same for the employee retention tax credit. They're actually reviewed by hand, I kid you not. So there's been huge delays. And typically we're finding it takes about six to nine months to review it. But when they review it um, and they ultimately approve it, you get a IRS check. You get one of those refund checks, the little rainbow IRS US Treasury checks. That's it. There's no forgiveness process. There's no paperwork beyond that, nothing else. And by the way, with your 941X, typically your payroll provider can do it for you. So this one's pretty straightforward, as you can see. Um, before I go on, um, we're only because of essential workers, only three families and lost 75% of business. Are we eligible for anything? Luana, hang in there. We're gonna, we're gonna talk in, in a couple of minutes and um, I think we might have some qualification for you. Um, and we had to close in January, 2022. Is there any funds? Unfortunately, Katrina, for this particular um, the programs we're talking about, they ended September 2021. So unfortunately, they, they didn't extend outward beyond that. That was a decision that Congress made. So let's talk about the employee retention tax credit. And um, this one's been a favorite of mine for a long time because I think there's a tremendous amount of potential for most small businesses, um, especially child care providers, but any small business. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, so as I mentioned, I believe, and this is after having done many, many PPPs, and we've done many ARTCs, that this is arguably easier than the PPP, but it's similar. So this is a payroll-based system, and we'll talk about what that means. Just like we were talking about with the FFCRA, there's no constraints on the refund. You can use it for anything. There's no forgiveness needed. You don't have to say how much was used for payroll, how much was used for this. It's your money. It's like a any other tax refund. You know, as I often say to providers, you know, if you want to go on the Caribbean vacation of a lifetime, you can. I know you're not going to. You're going to use this money to invest it wisely in your business. But I say that because you can do that with this. There is that flexibility. Again, this covers March 13th, 2020 through September 30, 2021. So it does have a limited period of time that you can look back for this. This only includes W-2 employees, excluding the owner and their relations. And so what do I mean by this? First of all, we get out of that W-2 employees. So unfortunately, sole proprietors, you can't be a part of this. Even if you have employees, you can't personally partake in this. Um, if you are a W-2 employee yourself and you own the business, again, you're excluded. Relations is very broadly defined. So it could be your cousin. It could be your aunt. Basically, if they're a relative of yours, they cannot be included in the calculations. So sometimes 
you know, and this is something to just be aware of because, you know, many times we'll see centers where there are some family members who are working together, which is wonderful. But for this particular program, it's not allowed. Um, but, but rarely do we see that every single one is related. We did have one case with that um, a while ago, but it's not very common. So let's talk a little bit about actually how you qualify, right? And there's three buckets for qualification that we want to talk about. So I told you the, when the hardest part was of the FFCRA, this is the hardest part of the ERTC right here. We're about to talk about it. After this, I promise it's all downhill. So number one is revenue reduction. So what we're looking at is we're looking at this by quarter. So this is by calendar quarter. So January, February, March, April, May, June, June, July, August, right? Those are the quarters. Uh, no, I did that wrong, didn't I? So January, February, March, April, May, June, I did have it. July, August, September. That's where I, I left September off. You know, I left one off there. So you're, you're going to break up your revenue by quarter. It includes all your revenue except the PPP. You can take any PPP money you got, you can take that right off your revenue. Otherwise, you have to include everything. It, what we do is we start with the base year. Oh, sorry. It's doing like the automatic recognition on my hand. So it now shows because I'm half Sicilian and I talk with my hands that I was raising my hand. So what we start with is 2019. And what we say is, what was your quarterly revenue in 2019 before the world ended? Right? That's your baseline. We compare 2019 to 2020 and 2019 to 2021, each corresponding quarter. So you would take 2019 quarter two and you compare it to the revenue on 2020 quarter two, 2019 quarter two to 2021 quarter two, right? So in other words, we're, we're not going back to the previous year, we're going back to the year before everything ended. And what we're looking for is, is a couple of different thresholds, right? The rules changed significantly in 2021. So you see there'll be a couple of places where we're going to talk about different rules for 2020 versus 21. In 2020, to trigger the ERTC, so to start it, you needed to have a 50% or greater reduction from 2019, right? So you need to show that you went down by at least half your revenue. That starts the ERTC. To continue it, you need a 20% or greater reduction. The last thing to know is, and I affectionately say you get the last quarter free, the way the statute is written is that you are still eligible until the end of the quarter in which you are recovered. So for example, if you, oops, sorry, accidentally hit that. I'm gonna show like going through the numbers, but for example, if let's say you had a 50% reduction in quarter two, then a 20% reduction in quarter three. And then in quarter four, let's say you only had a 5% reduction, or maybe you got a bunch of stimulus and you actually made more than 100%, you would still qualify. You get that last quarter for free. In 2021, it gets a little easier because in 2021, it's a straight 20% reduction. If you have a 20% or greater reduction, it'll trigger it and continue it. Again, you still get one quarter for free. Spoiler alert, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna give you access to um, a free public um, app that we created with uh, our client in Milwaukee, I'm sorry, in Wisconsin, which can help you actually plug your numbers in and determine this yourself. So, you know, don't worry, there's gonna be some resources that are gonna help you through this. Second thing, second qualification, partial business cessation or a mandated closure. So this is a really interesting one. And, I, and I'm sure, I am sure many of you have received many emails, texts, smoke signals, whatever, telling you about how you can get millions of dollars from the government for the ERTC. Um, and many times what they'll talk about is partial business cessation. And what we found in our work is that many times 
these kind of fly by night organizations are being very liberal with this particular clause. So here's what the, what the IRS actually says. And this is the exact wording. The IRS says, I mean, a mandated closure is easy. If you have a government order that said you had to close, you're covered. The problem is the partial business cessation, because that's the weird one. So what the IRS says is that you have to have a 10% or more reduction in the capacity to provide goods or services, right? So gosh, what does that mean, right? And, and I should say all of this has to be because of a state or local government order. So it can't just be because you wanted to, it had to be, you had to do it. Wasn't optional, you had to do it. So if we take, for example, Bawana's uh, question in the comments, right? Where she was open because of essential workers and her, you know, that was a government order. You had to be open in many cases or you had a choice between being totally closed or being open and having reduced capacity that would likely cover you. If let's say you had a school-based program and the school district, it was a, a public school district that closed, that is considered a government order, right? So there is a lot of opportunities here in terms of what a government order is, but it had to be something that said you had to do it. So it couldn't be just, you should. And we had this problem and still have it a lot, for example, in Texas, where we do a lot of work, because there wasn't a statewide government order for childcare, like there was in, let's say, um, New Jersey or Wisconsin. So we had to kind of look locally. And we've had a couple of orders where like the health department said, gosh, you should do all this stuff. And basically, you know, you should do social distancing and all this other things. But then at the, at the end, it would say, but you don't have to do this if you don't really want to. So it has to be an order, something that's compelling you. That order has to reduce the capacity to provide goods or services by 10% or more. So what does that mean? The example that the IRS provides is a great example. And when they first came out with this, what they said was, let's say you have a restaurant and your restaurant has 10 tables in it. A social distancing order comes in, you have to spread the tables out. So now you can only fit six tables, right? So you roll the other four in the back. The government says, well, that's a 40% reduction in your capacity to produce goods and services. So in other words, you haven't, they're not asking you how many people showed up for lunch, how many people showed up for dinner. They don't, they're not asking that because what they're afraid of is what happens if they just didn't like your stuff anymore, right? So, you know, if that's the, you know, if that was the case, right, then they might have a false positive, right? So what they're looking at is what is a objective way to really see if you had to have um, you know, you had this reduction. And so what they've said is it's about capacity. So for example, for a child care provider, right? Again, if we go to um, Bawana's great example, so thank you for writing that in the text because you're giving me a lot of fodder here, right? Let's say normally her capacity is 25 kids, but she can only really do three because she had to reduce um, capacity as we saw a lot of providers did because they had to reduce the number of kids in the classroom and other things that would then qualify. Now, if you notice, I didn't ask you how many kids didn't roll or any of those things. It has to be just based on capacity. So you can have a capacity reduction from 100 to 75 and maybe only 20 kids were actually attending. The government doesn't care, right? What they're saying is they wanna look at that capacity. So for providers, this has been a really interesting opportunity because many of you were subject to social distancing regulations and classroom caps that, that prohibited your ability um, to serve the same number of children you would in the, at the start of the pandemic. And the way you document this, by the way, is you would say, we had a government order from this date to this date. I've copied the order. We had to reduce our capacity to this amount per classroom, which took us from our normal capacity down to this other capacity. The last category, and I promise, by the way, I do see there's a couple of questions in the chat. I will get to you. I just want to get through these first real quick, is a recovery startup business. Now, this is the easiest one of all. So what the, what the, what the government said was that 
a lot of businesses that started during the pandemic didn't have a chance to get the PPP or other stimulus, but they still had a lot of stress. So if your business started after February 15th, 2020, and made less than a million dollars in annual revenue, you can get up to 50,000 in quarter three and quarter four separately. So it'd be 50,000 each in quarter three and quarter four of 2021. So that's an easy one if you started a business. And, and by the way, it does have to be a totally new operation. So in other words, if you're a childcare provider and you have a center and then you opened up another center, but it's the same business, let's say it's the same LLC, that wouldn't count. But a lot of childcare providers, every time they open up a center, they create a new LLC that would be eligible. So let me take a pause for one minute here. Um, Kenya had asked, so what if my daughter works for me and I'm the owner, can she get it? Unfortunately, she can't with the ERTC. FFCRA, she can. But with the ERTC, she would not be eligible, even if she's an adult and she's entirely emancipated from you. Unfortunately, um, you know, that is, that's the rules I don't make. Um, Katrina asked, is the revenue per quarter, do we also include our unemployment money? Um, you would not include unemployment money. You would include any government funding that you receive. So if you received additional sti uh, stipends, or if you received any sort of stabilization funds um, from the state, those would be included. Great questions. So let's look at um, a real quick example of what this looks like for the revenue side of things, because this, this like I said, this is the hardest part. So we have an example, and I'm keeping the numbers simple. So you know, don't anyone feel bad if you're if you say, "Wow, that's so little," or "That's so much to make in revenue." Um, I'm doing it because it's easy. So let's say in 2020 or 2019, our example provider had $100,000 in every quarter, right? Again, because it's easy for me. In 2020, we would then start by looking at each quarter. Remember, in this quarter, we're looking for a 50% drop or more. Well, quarter one, we usually don't look at. It's pretty rare. You can look at it, but there was only... Um, 18 days that were eligible. So it's rare to really qualify by revenue here. But let's say in quarter two, she dropped down to $48,000 in revenue, right? And in this case, she had a 52% drop, right? So she went from 100,000 in quarter two, 2019 to 48,000. So she's qualified. Quarter three, she, she started to do a little bit better. Some of the kids came back. She had some, some ability to bring back some of the workers. So she's doing a little bit better. Still though, that's a 25% reduction from the 100,000. Still qualifies. So now we know she has quarter two and quarter three. Quarter four, she, she, some stimulus kicked in. She got some stabilization money from her state. She actually made more than she made in quarter four of 2019. Again, as we talked about, you get that last quarter for free. So in this case, she would still be eligible. So she's now gotten quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. Let's look at 2021. And again, remember, we're comparing it to 2019. In that case, she still made another 105 because she had that stabilization money kicking in. Well, now she got her last quarter for free, right? So now if you compare that to the 100,000, she, she doesn't qualify. Let's say quarter two, she gets hit again, the state money stops coming. Um, she goes from 100,000 to 78,000. That's a 22% reduction. She qualifies. Quarter three, again, she does better, right? She's up by 10%. But again, she still gets that quarter because she gets that one quarter to recover. And then again, quarter four, no eligibility for anyone, right? Because that was the program ended early to reallocate funds to the infrastructure uh, initiatives that Congress took on. So again, as you can see, um, I wanna say it's easy, but there are ways that you can very quickly string together a lot of eligibility from revenue alone, like forget about the government orders or anything else. Um, let me ask a couple of quick, answer a couple of quick questions before we get to the next slide. I want to ask, uh, we've opened, in, we opened in 2018 and growing in family childcare, but pandemic hit in 2020. Um, 
Yes, and that may be hard. I think what you're probably alluding to is if you had a newer business, sometimes these revenue curves could be hard because you were still growing in 2019. So your revenue might have been lower than what you anticipated. Unfortunately, those are the numbers. Yeah, it's tough. It really is. Um, but unfortunately, you do have to use the 2019 numbers. Um, Kenya had asked, I applied an LLC in 2021. Would I qualify for startup? That would be tricky. It would depend a lot on your personal circumstances. So that's one um, where you'd want to look very carefully at it. And was it a really a new operation? So let's talk a little bit about, now that we've talked a bit about how much, you know, how you can qualify, how much it can be, right? And, and some of these numbers, I still, after like two years of doing this, find startling, right? Or three years of doing this. First, um, if it is in 2020, right, you would, so remember we had that eligibility in 2020 and I said the rules sometimes differ between 2020 and 2023. In 2020, you get for covered periods, 50% of up to $10,000 in wages per employee for the year. So in other words, even if you, let's say you only have two quarters of eligibility, you can get up to $10,000 per employee. And I'll show you an example of this as well. You know, and so, um, I'm sorry, you get up to $5,000 per employee, it's up to 10,000 of revenue. So you're getting half of that, that oh, I'm sorry, half of that wages. It's been a long day. So you get half of the 10,000, so up to $5,000 an employee. 2021, it gets better. In 2021, it's 70% of up to $10,000 in wages per employee per quarter. So what that means is quarterly, you can get up to $7,000 per employee, right? So if you take the fact that there are three quarters that you could have eligibility, that means you could have up to 21,000 per employee. And, and what I should say in, in the states that we're working in, like New Jersey, it was around 335,000 on average that we were doing per center. Um, in Texas, it's 227,000. So this money can really add up, as you can imagine. And these are not like mega centers. These are actually much smaller centers because a lot of the really big centers had their accountants do this or were kind of picked off by some of the fly-by-night companies early on. Um, we only work in places where we're being paid for by the state or by a charity to, to work with you. We don't charge uh, centers at all or home-based providers. So let's look at how this plays out. So if we take this example, right, where let's say there's $5,000 a quarter in gross wages. Again, I'm keeping it easy, right? Um, in this case, in 2020, if they got 50% a quarter two, that'd be $2,500 in wages. 50% a quarter three, another 500. Now remember, this provider had eligibility in quarter four, but She's hit the maximum of 5,000. She's done, right? So she's hit that maximum per employee. She's good to go. Now, if we look at 2021 and her eligibility, right? Let's say she had eligibility in all three quarters. In this case, she'd be 3,500 plus 3,500 plus 3,500, which is 70% of 5,000. So she would be getting 10,500 for that employee. So in this case, just for this one employee, she's looking at $15,500. So you can see where this really starts adding up very quickly. And I do see there we're getting some more questions in the chat. I'll get to them. Let me get through this a little bit. And then I think, you know, we can jump into the chat a little bit and open it up for other questions. This, again, is really remarkably easy. The first part is, and this always drives people crazy because they want us to give them a form or something. And, you know, what you need to keep in mind is that you know, remember those heady days back in like March and April 2020 when we thought this was all going to be a few weeks? So when this was built, it was built during that time and it continued far past that period. But when they set up the rules, it was set up at a time where they thought this was just going to be quick. So they said, let's just get it out there. And so you actually self-certify your own eligibility. You don't have to send it anywhere. Definitely keep a record of it for yourself. Take that photo, like I always recommend, right? But you just self-certify it. So if let's say you, you certify by revenue, 
you'd take the figures that you put in an Excel spreadsheet, or if you wanted to do it by hand, whatever, you hold on to that. If you had a government order, hold on to the government order. That's it. Now you're self-certified. Put that in a file, take some photos of it, you're good to go. Second, you have to alert the IRS. Now remember with this one, it's only for W-2 employees. So you have to use that 941X. Um, typically what people do is they contact their payroll company. Um, if, you know, I know for many of you, um, cause the payroll companies originally, it's funny if you think about the arc of this, when we started with it, payroll companies didn't know what we were talking about and we had to educate them. Then they started to get it and they didn't like it because it was annoying for them, but they would do it. And now they've realized, gosh, there's a whole lot of money in this business. And so they've been charging more. So I would be very careful on what you're being charged. Make sure you ask them the charges up front. But typically, your payroll company will do this for you, will do the paperwork. And, and it's, again, the paperwork, by the way, is changing that 941X. And, by, and, and I should say, because you'll hear this from some of the fly-by-night companies, you're, what you're seeing is what you get. This is not so complicated. This is not, you know, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of work. Not even close. Finally, what you do is you put that nine forty one X in, just like what we were talking about with the FFCRA. These are hand reviewed, so it does take some time. About six to nine months is what we're seeing right now. Um, you receive a check, and again, it's one of those rainbow colored IRS checks, U.S. Treasury. You deposit it. There's no forgiveness. There's no question about how to use it. Really, this is this straightforward. So let me talk a little bit about some resources that we have for you. Whoops. And, and then we'll, we'll go back to answering some of these questions. One, um, the Wisconsin um, Early Childhood Association um, engaged us to create an app. This is absolutely free. And I know it says Wisconsin, but wherever you are, and I know we have people from all over today, like if you're in Minnesota, Washington, we do have somebody from of some Wisconsin, which is awesome. Um, you know, if you're in Iowa, wherever you are, um, this still works for you. So don't worry, even though it says Wisconsin, they were the ones who were gracious enough to pay for it, but they've asked us to open this up to childcare providers. And by the way, if you know somebody who's not a childcare provider, like let's say a significant other or sibling or whomever, friend, they can use this too. There's nothing stopping them. It's the same math. Right, so don't hesitate to let them use it. It's the only thing. It's the only program of its kind that's freely offered. Um, what you is very easy to use. Um, you'll go through it. Um, you'll be able to assess relatively quickly um, what that eligibility is. Whoops, excuse me. Um, the other thing that we have available. Um, as I mentioned, we do coaching. We don't do this retail, so unfortunately, don't email us. We don't, we don't just do this for people off the street. We don't believe in taking a percentage of your credit. That's not what we do. We do this with states, um, you know, uh, regional organizations, philanthropy, so we can offer it free to providers. If you are in Colorado, Indiana, New Hampshire, Texas, or Wisconsin, we have either partners or we are directly helping with this absolutely free of charge. We don't charge you anything. We can't. It would be illegal and unethical, unethical and illegal, right? So again, if you take this QR code, it'll take you to a page. You can sign up for help. Um, and this is, um, you know, something that could be, you know, really save you literally tens of thousands of dollars. And we've had, unfortunately, Kalinda, uh, Kalita, um, we are not in California. These are the states we're in right now. We're always happy to work with other states. So if you want to get with, you know, your uh, association or others, Oregon, uh, know as well. Unfortunately, these are the states that we're funded to work in right now. But we're open to working with others. Um, we just don't work directly with providers. And I wish I had a better answer, but we just don't believe in in kind of charging you for it. And, um, you know, so this is these are the states that we're currently in, but we can do that. A um, couple of other free resources real quick. We have a bunch of tax resources, knowing that it's tax season. I know it's a little off topic, but just so you have it. And um, finally, uh, for those of you in the family care world, if you know Tom Copeland's Taking Care of Business site, which is a, a famous site for B 
being a, a central nexus for family child care businesses and everything you need to know. Uh, Tom retired back in May. Uh, he bequeathed the site to us, so we're on that site. It's absolutely free. We respond to your calls, your emails, your texts free of charge. So that's another resource. So let me get that out of the way for a few minutes. Let me catch up on some of these questions we had. Um, and I should say, let me do one other thing because I noticed that the link that we had was unfortunately the one for doing, you can self-assess your taxes on that one. Let me give you the one that I want you to have for here. And that's the ERTC one. There was a little bit of a miscommunication there. So I'm putting it in the chat. And by the way, these are everything we do is in English and Spanish. So, and not with my battalion, like actual native speakers. So these are the links that I wanted you to have. You see these links in here, ERTC dash ing dash glide app dash or dot dot glide dash glide app dot io. And then there's a Spanish version of it as well. These will allow you to self-assess your eligibility. And at the end of it, you'll be asked for your email address. We don't keep it, it gets flushed out of the system, but it'll allow you to get an email of your results. So if you do wanna look over them, you do wanna work with somebody on it, you have that qualification there already. Um, so those are a bunch of, of free resources to think about. Um, let me catch up really quickly on some of these ones. Um, Employee retention tax credit, we're eligible. Will we receive a self-employment tax reduction or is this money that we receive to give to our employees? The, the money, Katrina, goes to you directly. Um, it's, it's essentially like any other tax refund. You could do with it as it please. You can share it with your employees. You could not, it's up to you. Um, for the FFCRA, would a provider go by their 2023 Schedule C? No, you, you actually have to use the Schedule C of a given year. So if you had a Schedule C, your eligibility, let's say in 2020 and 2021, you'd have to use 2020 for that eligibility and then 2021 for that eligibility. And that's where it is a little bit, I know a lot of you are gonna be very frustrated about it, we are too. It's a little bit unfair because you're paid very differently um, when you're on a Schedule C and you're a sole proprietor. Unfortunately, those are the rules, I didn't make them. Um, other issues with family care provider and have corporations, we're not paying ourselves. Um, not sure what the question is there. You know, certainly it may be difficult. I think a lot of you, and maybe this is what you're saying, did not take payroll at all during the pandemic. Um, so that is a challenge, right? When you weren't paying yourself, um, you know, wages, but yes, you unfortunately had to be being paid at the time, even if you're the owner. Um, I was transitioned from home daycare to opening a center and still waiting on center to open. Something I'm leasing. Okay. Um, so in that case, if you're not actually operating, you would not be eligible. Even if you were trying to operate during that period, if you weren't actually transacting, and, and the, the government defines it as somebody's paying you for work. So it can't be, well, we're trying to open or we're doing some training of personnel. It has to be you are actually exchanging money for your services. Um, I think that uh, comes back. I know uh, Dinah is, is also asking about California. California is included. If you're in any other state, you can apply for this. We just don't provide support for it. Um, I was still pen my home daycare. Okay, so you were still running your home daycare. Then, you know, Kenya, you would, you know, if you did have eligibility for the FFCRA, that would be an option. If you had W-2 employees, you would theoretically be able to apply for the ERTC, again, if you had availability. Other questions, and people can come off audio if they want. Like, I mean, come I off wanna mute. Go ahead and, I wanna go ahead and make a lot of people yeah. to unmute themselves. If someone wants to unmute and ask a question out loud, you're welcome. Lots of questions though. There's a lot in this presentation. Yeah, yeah so Jojo, um, if provider applies, this tax credit, do we need to alter our tax report? So what's gonna happen is you're gonna alter that 941X, which is your quarterly payroll tax return for the federal government. You, you, you probably, some of you who are using payroll companies may not even know you're doing it and it's happening. So do know that that is, that's often happening in the background, even if you're not aware of it, they're there. Um, and that's what you're altering. And then that would generate the, the refund for you. I hope that answers the question. And don't hesitate if I haven't to come off mute and, and ask away. 
So I'm just wondering, basically, this would have to be like a payroll situation where either we paid ourselves or paid our employees, but had less income in order to receive this employee retention? Right? Yeah, or, or one of those other qualifications. So what's interesting about it is, you know, with the government order piece, right, look very closely at that. Because, you know, we had providers and for example, okay, I'll, I'll give you a prime example. Um, basically the first year of the pandemic in New Jersey, every single childcare provider, family or center was under a government order from the governor of New Jersey where they had to decrease their ratios. And it was, it was by, I forget what it was, it was like 15, 20%. So it was past that 10% threshold. Right now, let's say for the sake of argument, um, Lizette, you know, was in the state of New Jersey. Lizette, I don't know where you are, so hopefully it's not insulting. So, you know, if she was in the state of New Jersey during that one year period, she would be eligible. Now, Lizette may have done really well. It doesn't make a difference. She had to reduce her capacity. And what the government's trying to get at is this is not about Lizette, like trying to fleece the government. I'm not picking on you, Lizette. Sorry. Um, but this is about um, the government saying, well, how do we really get at when your costs may have gone up, but you weren't getting more money? So even though Lizette may have been making as much or maybe even a little bit more than 2019, well, yeah, this revenue went up, but her costs went up too. So that's part of what they're trying to get at. So Katrina, I strongly recommend, which state are you in, Katrina? If California. I may ask, are you from California? I would be very surprised if you didn't have a government order for part of that period. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, that you may have had where you had to reduce your capacity or have something that influenced your capacity. Yeah. And if you did, even if your revenue was level or even if it went up, you'd still be eligible because your costs likely went up with it. Does that but, make sense? Yeah, but we didn't really have any employees. So we didn't really run payroll. And therefore, gotcha. We don't pay ourselves through payroll. So are we eligible for employee retention credit or not? You wouldn't. No. I mean, are you a sole proprietor? Okay. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you would not be. Sole proprietors, unfortunately, are not eligible for it. Okay. I wish that was different. But the gotcha. FFCRA, take a look at it. Okay. That's you would be eligible for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, potentially. I don't want to say you're like automatically eligible. You yeah, would yeah, be yeah. potentially okay. eligible. Yeah, no. Like, then the guy on the webinar said, I can get money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is how I get myself into trouble. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, there was a question about giving a certificate for attending. Benny, we typically don't do that. I don't know if you do um, continuing ed credit. Yeah, not for this session, no. Okay. Sorry. But hopefully you learned something and I was mildly entertaining. Any other questions? I know there's a person who's listed as iPhone. There will be a recording. You missed that earlier. Benny did say that they will be posting a recording of it. We'll be posting it as well, just in case people missed it. Um, you know, definitely um, you can listen to the whole thing end to end. Can I, can I talk? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. and. Uh, um, one family got sick and I closed childcare only for one day because of um, some definition of uh, distance and other stuff. Anyway, the childcare was closed, but I don't remember it was probably 21 for one day. Uh, is it eligible and what kind of form I need to adjust or do? Yeah. So... Would you be eligible? Yes. How would you do it? You would file an amendment, what's called the 1040X, mm -hmm. to, your, to your filing from that tax year. And you would include, um, I believe it's 7202, form 7202, which is the form to request the credit. What I would say is, and I'm just being um, honest about it here, and this is again another problem of when you're when your office when your office schedule C and you're doing your 1040, typically you'll engage somebody to help you with this, like your tax preparer. They'll usually 
charge you a little bit. So definitely look ahead of time and get an idea of how much you're gonna get first, because for one day, frankly, it may not be worth the money to have it changed. Um, so I just wanna make sure you have a heads up. And, you know, and that's again, a difference between FFCRA where the numbers can sometimes be smaller than the ERTC where typically the numbers are bigger, which is why you're seeing a lot of people saying, we'll do it for 20 to 25%. Um, does that help? Yeah, it helps a lot. Thank you very much. But I need to divide the amount of money in line 31 by 260 days. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will go with your advice. Thank you. No, no problem. No problem. And I would say, you know, definitely if you're if you're in these states, right? Number one, if you're in the states that we're working in, please do avail yourself of it. This is real. This is free. We don't charge you. We don't get anything extra from it. We're getting paid either way. Um, Even state Washington? I wish I was. I'm not, you know, and that's like, <laughs> it's a little bit frustrating because we're only in five states. We're happy to go there, you know, so don't hesitate to talk to your state reps or others. Um, we are, you know, always happy to work in other states and work with partners. So for example, in New Hampshire, we don't directly do the coaching early learning New Hampshire does, and we work with them very closely, but they're able to do it locally. And we're always happy to share this information. Um, so, you know, please do avail yourself of the resources. If you go to the link I gave on self-assessment, um, it'll also lead you to a guide that tells you how to do this. We've had a number of providers who have done it themselves working with their payroll company. And I just say that because when you look at the charges and the going rate is 20 to 25% of your credit. So, so if you think about it for a minute, we're doing 227 on average in Texas, right? That's a lot of money. And I'm gonna to be totally transparent about this. There was an article that I instigated a couple of months ago in the Wall Street Journal, because I was really fed up with a lot of what we were seeing was happening to childcare providers with these percentages. And they did an article on it. And I'm quoted in it, I was totally transparent. What we charge state government philanthropy is $800 a case. And let me tell you, at $800, we're happy, right? Like nobody's going poor. But think about that. We're charging like $800 a case. These people are telling you 20 to 25% of your credit to do it. So be really careful. If you feel like you can self-navigate it, I strongly recommend trying to self-navigate it. It's not as hard as you think. And it's a lot of money that they want to take. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox for, okay, you already answered Betty. Sorry. I saw there was a question that was pending. Excellent. Other, other questions. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Benny, you want to close this out? Yeah. Well, Gary, that was an incredible session. I think everyone really got a lot of value and information out of that. We will be sharing the recording out. Um, and hopefully we'll have a lot of other resources related to this going out to our whole community. Um, Gary, thank you very much for, you know, just spilling all that information and knowledge with all the providers here. Um, hopefully people will be able to have some extra cash in their pockets after this. Um, you know, everyone stay tuned. Again, I'm Benny from Playground. We're always happy to support the childcare community um, and we're going to continue doing more events. So stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you very much for joining. Take Thank care. You,